think we're ready. in class and we assign Greg Randon's at uh, the end of the minute and in discussing race in class I want to begin with an overview of the significance of the concept of the frontier uh, in uh, American history. Um, it has long been a uh, very potent symbol an idea in uh, North America and both in terms of writers uh, and in terms of scholars, uh, there's a fairly large body of scholarship in the mid uh, 20th century in which uh, American history becomes much more popular. And uh, Frederick Jackson Turner was the most prominent uh, major historian who defined the United States in large part because of a frontier. For Frederick Jackson Turner, Europeans came to the New World uh, in various waves and stages, uh, and uh, they came to define themselves as American rather than British or um, another someplace somewhere else in the, uh, Europe uh, by entering this frontier space. Uh, and in entering this frontier space, uh, that inspired them. There was a kind of regeneration so that they become American. Uh, it becomes very popular. And beginning in the 1970s, Richard Slotkin, who was a longtime professor at Wesleyan, wrote a trilogy on uh, regeneration through violence, um, and uh, particularly racial violence. Uh, two of the books won major awards. If you haven't read Slotkin's uh, trilogy, I'd begin with, um, uh, I'd actually begin with The Gunfighter Nation, his one on the 20th century. But his argument is he is borrowing from and revising this long-held um, idea of the significance of the frontier. Uh, and he um, argues that from really the colonial period to the present, one of the ways in which white Americans define and clarify themselves as Americans and as successful is that they enter um, a frontier wilderness, particularly immigrants or someone who's for the frontier wilderness, and engage in race warfare with the dark-skinned other, typically indigenous or uh, African Americans. And uh, through this warfare, if they survive, they return from the frontier back into civilization, back into society, with their essential whiteness clarified and purified. That's basically his argument. And he borrows heavily from the tradition of uh, the West, whether it's James Fenmore Cooper in the 19th century to the huge popularity of Westerns um, throughout the 20th century in uh, fiction uh, and in film, highlighting uh, the racial uh, aspect of it. Um, you see a recent example in the book of um, the hugely successful book uh, by Cormac McCarthy, Blood Meridian, which is published in 1985, considered a masterpiece. Uh, it's seen as another form of this regener regeneration uh, through violence. Um, and uh, for Slotkin, the, um, that this, uh, this regeneration through violence, he ends the, the last trilogy by recognizing that this frontier myth, which is and I, uh, this, this symbol, this idea, could also function as a way to generate a interracial um, uh, a body politic uh, by having African Americans uh, and whites working together to fight this enemy. And he uses examples uh, from World War II, Vietnam, different wars in which black and white soldiers are required to fight this this threatening, powerful enemy together, they reemerge from this frontier uh, uh, violent space um, and achieve a kind of uh, interracialism. Um, and uh, Greg Grandin, in his book, um, is focusing on politicians and elites and discussing the evolution of uh, this frontier myth um, and uh, highlighting the way in which uh, 
um, class and uh, race are intertwined. Brandon's, in my view, his book focuses um, primarily on uh, race without paying as much difference uh, to class, um, and particularly when he gets to uh, um, following the New Deal uh, era. Um, in fact, so he refers to uh, Nixon's, he refers to Nixon's, uh, G. Gordon Liddy ran Nixon's plumbers, burglars who broke into Watergate Hotel, precipitating Nixon's downfall. And another aide to Nixon was Arpaio, the racist sheriff of Maricopa County, Arizona, who imposed brutal, deadly conditions on Latino prisoners. Uh, Arpaio would become the, er, an early supporter of Trump. He begins his book, as you know, by describing Trump is wanting an end to this myth of the frontier by saying we're building a wall so that you cannot, it's going to be much harder to, to, um, re to return from a frontier space into uh, uh, American civilization. It's actually to keep Mexicans out. Um, for Reagan, Carter, uh, Reagan actually, uh, Brandon is very critical of uh, uh, Reagan and um, Bush and Clinton and Obama. I mean, he's not that happy with the recent presence we've had in relationship to uh, this understanding the power of uh, the myth of the frontier. He says that, uh, um, he quotes Reagan as saying that Carter wants us to be miserable with the thermostat order, uh, an excessive regulatory burden. Um, he quotes Carter saying, we believe that our nation's resources were limitless, which is uh, a, uh, one of the reasons why he lost re-election. Reagan kicks off his 1980 general election campaign in the Shoba County Fair in rural Mississippi, where three civil rights workers had been murdered 16 years earlier, and he announces his support for states' rights in, his, um, in kicking off his campaign. Um, and. Uh, President Bush, first President Bush, uh, he quotes him as saying, when I talk with foreign leaders about new markets for American products, is it foreign policy or domestic? Both, Bush said. We saw the frontier beyond the stars um, within ourselves. So uh, he's um, describing this uh, regenerative vision of the frontier in, in truly cosmic terms. Um, and uh, I won't go into detail, you've read it, but Clinton he is very critical of Clinton uh, and uh, his NAFTA. Um, uh, he describes Obama as uh, election as packaged on an emotional wallop, but produced only, quote, a policy whimper. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's um, the, the overview of the significance of the frontier in American um, politics, in culture, um, in literature, in art, and uh, I think the ongoing power of the frontier continues to be resonant. A number of um, artists and writers and scholars have um, broadened the frontier to include a, a certain urban area in which that urban area is set apart from the rest of the city. So it doesn't have to be this kind of wilderness space um, or a space that stands outside of an urban area that a frontier space can be within a, uh, a major metropolitan city. Um, so it's more about how one understands and interprets uh, this frontier environment and how one enters it to become regenerated and then returns uh, to the, um, the life that he or she had a, with his uh, either more racist and in some cases um, in the near present, a collaboration, an interracial collaboration where he becomes enlightened by um, the long history of uh, races. And one of the central questions is the relationship uh, between race and class in the United States. Most Americans, um, in um, my view, uh, certainly at Harvard, see race as more significant than class. And um, I'm 
uh, and that's a discussion that we would like to have. And that last view that you say that the race is more significant than class directly contradicts the ideas of many of the leading black theoreticians, yes. right? Like Du Bois, for example. Yes. So, in fact, we discussed Du Bois um, was uh, recognized the, in, a, in a sense the greater importance of class um, than he did um, of race, uh, particularly in his uh, younger years. Um, Booker T. Washington, who was constrained because Booker T. was born um, as an enslaved person in the South, and he was hugely successful at raising money from white liberal Southerners to create um, schools for African Americans. And uh, Booker T. was primarily focused on, because he raised in today's dollars you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and created these foundational schools for African Americans. And he understood that working, that, that, that uh, obtaining money from white Southerners, um, he could do so by focusing on class. He could not get a penny if he focused on race. Um, and uh, he was very successful. Du Bois was much more, was more of a radical. It's also important to understand Du Bois spent most of his time in the free in the in the former free states in the north. Had Du Bois spent, lived for most of his life in the south, he almost certainly would have um, changed his rhetoric to accord more similarly to Booker T. Washington. Um, and so the geography matters and. Uh, especially in the 19th century in the post-Reconstruction period, uh, the divide between North and South was profound. Yeah. They were really like two separate countries in many respects. Well, John, I, I want to take off from those, those remarks of yours and uh, develop a, a narrative, a conception of this relation between race and class leading up to a polemic which I began in an earlier class against the present racial orthodoxy in the United States. Right. So first, I recur to the idea introduced in an early class during the semester that the United States not only is a class society and has a class structure, but has a class structure which is a uh, a variant of the dominant class structure in the rich North Atlantic countries. There's, at the top, there's a professional and business class. There's a fringe at the top of that class of a, uh, a plutocracy with enormous wealth. Then there is a small business class beneath the professional and business class. Then there is a working class with both a blue collar and a white collar segment. Uh, and under the working class, there is a racially stigmatized underclass, which has jobs in the secondary part of the labor market of unstable employment and fills the American prisons also. Uh, the United States being one of the countries which has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. Uh, now, contrary to the self-understanding of the Americans, there have been very few episodes of mass social mobility in the United States. The two most important episodes were the ones by which the children of farmhands became blue-collar workers, and the second was the one in which the children of white-collar workers, blue-collar workers, became white-collar workers. Uh, but great restriction on social mobility. Uh, and nevertheless, a dominant conception in the country is that the majority of Americans belong to something like, called the middle class, 
And in trying to interpret this label, middle class, I propose to interpret it as meaning something like the following. A worker with a bourgeois identity, that is, the middle class designates the small business class uh, and the two sides of the working class, the blue collar and the, and the white collar. Uh, now, if we place this class structure of the United States in a comparative international context, uh, a problem that arises also anticipated in our arguments in previous classes is the following. In most countries in the world, the majority of people are poor. If not absolutely poor, then relatively poor. But their horizon of aspiration is not proletarian. It is petty bourgeois. They aspire to a modest prosperity and independence. And by default, the practical manifestation of that aspiration is isolated, archaic family business, retrograde family business, typically dependent on family saving and self-exploitation. And the spiritual counterpart to that archaic, retrograde economic aspiration is uh, familism, if you could call that the priority according to the family, individualism, materialism, and consumerism. Uh, and theologically, the theology of prosperity, in which some form of material success is interpreted as a sign of divine favor. Uh, the task of the progressives in this situation would be to understand that this is the majority with this default economic and spiritual direction to, to approach them, to approach this majority, and to try and present it with a broader repertoire of economic and spiritual alternatives. So, economically alternatives to isolated, regressive family business as the dominant form of economic activity, and spiritual alternatives that would be more ambitious, magnanimous, and solidaristic than the ones that are evoked by the theology of prosperity. The question I ask in relation to this second moment in my argument is, uh, what is the counterpart in the United States, if there is a counterpart, to this worldwide phenomenon of the, what one could call the subjective petty bourgeoisie? They're not objectively petty bourgeois because the majority are not members of the small business class, but they are subjectively petty bourgeois because they are oriented to these characteristic economic and spiritual aspirations. Uh, what is the counterpart to that in the United States? And maybe the counterpart is the existence of a large part of the working class that is uncredentialed, that is not benefited by the discourse or the practices of diversity and inclusion. Uh, and that has many of the characteristics that I just attributed to what I call the subjective petty bourgeoisie. Uh, and this then would come together with a reinterpretation of the so-called class realignment in American politics, in which the conservative party, the Republican party, uh, has more and more as its voting base this uncredentialed part of the working class with these petty bourgeois aspirations and these default spiritual ambitions that I just described. Now, throughout the world, in, in all of these societies, there is a tension or a contradiction between the class structure and democracy. And we could use the Marxist label capitalism, uh, from, whom, who, from whose presuppositions I dissent. Uh, 
There is no such indivisible system. But we'll use it in a, in a, in, in a loose form to describe the established form of the market economy that sustains this class structure that I just described. There's a contradiction between that and democracy. Because even a weak democracy is based on the principle of political equality, and there's an obvious contradiction between the promises of political equality and the reality of economic inequality. What lies to, to the extent that these two ideas of capitalism and a democracy, despite their tensions, nevertheless have a possible area of affinity, it has to do with the idea of agency, of freedom. So the power of the individual to stand up, to react to his context, to engage with his context, to transform it, and the enhancement of agency is perhaps the most powerful ideal in the world today, not just in the United States. Hence, just the <coughs> significance of the frontier is all about the individual agency. Because it's a privileged terrain for the expression and development of agency. That's exactly huh? right. uh, now, uh, Tocqueville, whose work we've selected in the course, uh, I think, made the central mistake of taking as his guiding theme in the interpretation of the Americans of his time, equality. Yeah. Equality was never the ruling passion of the Americans. The ruling passion of the Americans was, when I just described agency, the ability to stand up and act, and it has not just an economic expression, but a spiritual expression, the participation of the individual in the inner life of God. The, the, so that the objective becomes not the humanization of society, but the divinization of humanity expressed in each individual human person. Uh, uh, now then I come to the relation between class and race. And my central theme for discussion is that in understanding this relation, the Americans took the wrong turn. Uh, so let me first give an overview of the main approaches to the relation between race and class in the United States in American history for the entirely practical purpose of helping to elucidate my programmatic thesis about what should be done now. So one approach after the Civil War was the collaborationist or accommodationist approach, illustrated by the activities and ideas of Booker T. Washington, whom we were discussing before class. Uh, so the idea was the blacks, the freed slaves, the ex-slaves, should assume a position in society as smallholders, as craftsmen, as artisans, as members of the small business class. At the time in which the, the artisanal ideal had already... Had already waned, or was beginning to wane in economic reality but the blacks would succeed to this vanishing world, and there they would find a niche. Yes. Uh, and this was an idea which was seen as uh, practical because it was acceptable. It was acceptable to the ruling forces in American society who would then be willing to tolerate it and to finance it. Now, I think there is a paradox in this collaborationist approach, which deserves some comment. The paradox is that despite the seeming modesty of its ambitions, the collaborationist approach requires to be successful a tremendous amount of mobilization, of mass mobilization. And to me, as a, a, an observer, it seems implausible that there could be such a mass mobilization uh, 
and that if it occurred or to the extent it occurred, it would be satisfied with such a modest result. That is, either it would not achieve the mobilization necessary to, in fact, establish the blacks as the representatives of this new small business class, or it would be uh, achieved, the mass mobilization, but then having been achieved, it would want more. It would not stay with that, with that modesty of ambitions. Now, the second approach to the racial issue, to racial oppression in the United States, has been the secessionist approach. And in its most literal and extreme form, it uh, is expressed by the desire to return to Africa, the actual flight from the country into an African world. Uh, and, but almost always, this idea of secession, of withdrawal, is replaced by internal exile in the United States. And that's what we saw already in Elijah Muhammad and then uh, in his uh, mentee Farrakhan and in many other representatives of this idea. Uh, then this is a paradoxical result of this faint, if it is a faint, which is that the, the, the practical residue resembles the practical aspiration of the earlier approach, the collaborationist approach. That is, the creation of a world in which the blacks have small-scale economic activity, but above all, they have a moral universe of their own, characterized by petty bourgeois notions of hard work, diligence, responsibility, respectability, and so forth. That is, the internal exile is like a mirror image of what it seemed that the collaborationists wanted, but its rhetoric is the rhetoric of confrontation. Now I come to the third approach, which is the orthodox approach. It could be called the integrationist approach because it used the vocabulary of integration, but a more realistic and descriptive term might be the threshold approach. One might call it the threshold approach because it says race should be sharply distinguished from class. And uh, we have to deal with the problem of racial oppression or injustice as a separate and prior problem before we deal with the problems of economic inequality and of the class structure. And it, this this has become the orthodoxy of the country, of the American elites, resisted by the conservatives. Uh, it has had great achievements uh, in the civil rights legislation, and especially in the creation, in the development of a black professional and business bourgeoisie in the United States. But it has many failures. And a way to understand the logic of its failures is to focus on its signature policy, affirmative action. Uh, and you could say, what are the problems with affirmative action? There are three notable problems. The first is that it generates benefits that are in inverse proportion to the need for them. So the group that benefits most is the black professional and business elite, the, the black bourgeoisie, which is the group least in need of this benefit, once having been established and created. <coughs> then to a lesser extent, it, it benefits the black workers, especially in public employment, like policemen and firemen the organized black working class. What it evidently benefits least of all is the group which most stands in need, which is the vast majority of poor workers in the secondary and stable part of the labor market, the underclass, the last part of the American class structure. Those are hardly benefited at all by this policy. The second evil of the affirmative action
is its separation of the black elite, the natural leadership of the blacks, from the mass of poor blacks. The black elites are accommodated into the structure. They, they become collaborators of the structure and they benefit themselves by virtually representing the poor blacks, but in fact compromising with the elites. Uh, and the third evil is that it offends gravely the white working class majority of the country, which, with some justice, believes itself to be the victim of collusion between the white elites and these virtual representatives of the blacks. Uh, and in fact, that third factor helps explain the conservative ascendancy in the United States in the second half of the 20th century. When the conservatives, uh, represented especially by the Republican Party, uh, esta established their ascendancy on the basis of, combi of combining material concessions to the moneyed classes with moral concessions to the moneyless classes. <clears throat> So that critique then leads to the idea that there should be an alternative. Now before outlining what such an alternative might be, I want to evoke a fourth approach to the relation between race and class in the United States, which was the attempt briefly to connect them, especially in the period of Reconstruction immediately following the Civil War as illustrated by the activities of the Freedmen's Bureau. Always dramatically underfunded, but nevertheless vigorous in the attempt to promote educational and economic opportunity for the blacks, at least in the southern states. Uh, and represented by the famous slogan, 40 acres and a mule, in which the idea was that there would be distribution of land and economic opportunity for the blacks in agriculture. This was Sherman's field order, yeah. right? That's where the book ended up getting, uh, ended up getting uh, uh, shut down. Shut down, exactly. <laughs> but during, during the radical reconstruction, that's... Uh, that, that, was, was that was the program. Yeah, but that was... That, that was the program. And it was a time in which... That's a period in which... I mean, it's ironic that, that um, African Americans and progressive whites were united in one party, the Republican Party, that was began as an anti-slavery party. The founding of the Republican Party, the central platform was anti-slavery. Yeah. And unfortunately, in fact, Eric Foner in his um, uh, Free Labor, Free Soil book describes one of the tragic ironies of the Civil War is that um, the, tr their, the tragic irony is that uh, Northerners embraced this artisanal ideal and they imagine that continuing into the future. And so the white Southerners embraced this um, feudal slave ideal that they imagined extending. One big happy family. One big happy family. Yeah. Blacks and whites, yeah. and it was the Civil War more than by far any other single event that transformed, that destroys the artisanal ideal that becomes uh, a major incorporation. Um, uh, the rise of corporations, the rise of um, uh, of uh, big business, uh, which greatly, greatly limits the possibility of poor whites or blacks of becoming independent entrepreneurs, artisans. The artisanal ideal essentially gets uh, demolished. Uh, and uh, that was, and, and slavery is officially, legally abolished, mm -hmm. um, at least in name. Uh, and those were the tragic ironies. So you have this profound transformation in a very short period of time in which most other nations, there was a much more gradual transformation between artisanal 
and uh, corporate um, power. So uh, this third approach, this uh, racial orthodoxy that I just described, call it the integrationist or the threshold approach, has to some extent become the model, the paradigm for a broader political idea in the United States, which, you call, which is the idea of identity politics. So it's the idea that instead of focusing primarily on the class structure and the economic and political institutions that sustain and reproduce it, the initial focus, the threshold focus, should be on groups, whether minorities or not. In the case of women, they're not minorities. But always groups in which the definition of the category of the group, of its boundaries, is in some sense pre-political or pre-social. There is some physical characteristic, a characteristic expressed in the body, which predates society. So it's not just a creation of politics. And there's always been this idea in the United States that the pre-political is more fundamental than the political, that there are these constructions that we're divided by these natural forms, these natural characteristics, like gender, sexual orientation, supposedly, disability, uh, and that those are more fundamental than the ones that we create through, through, through politics. In fact, a vestige of this idea is inscribed in American constitutional doctrine. There's a so-called state action doctrine, which has great influence in American constitutional law, which distinguishes between situations in the existence of which the state is complicit, so there is state action, and other situations which are supposedly just naturally there, apart from state action. Uh, and of course, one would say by way of criticizing this idea that there are no such situations which are just there naturally, and that there is no action, there is no arrangement in society in the creation of which the state is not complicit. So on that basis, then the state action doctrine makes no sense. But in any event, that then becomes a model for a broader kind of politics. Now, uh, in my country, in Brazil, affirmative action and the American style of identity politics has been imitated. But the Brazilians call affirmative action the system of quotas not understanding that the idea of quota is actually a legal and constitutional anathema in the United States, and that the whole object is, is to present affirmative action as if it were not a system of quotas, but something else. Uh, and this leads to a, a set of complicated rhetorical and legal maneuvers in the United States, all designed to avoid the malediction, the curse of quotas, which the Brazilians have embraced as if it were entirely innocent and non-objectionable. Now this then takes us to the question, what then should be the alternative? What could be an example of a response to this problem that followed the lead of the, the Freedmen's Bureau in the Reconstruction period and attempted to connect race and class rather than to separate them. So during the, uh, the Republican Party was the, during the small window from its founding in 1855 through Reconstruction, uh, African Americans were united, uh, almost all of them, were Republicans. I mean, Martin Delaney, for example, a black leader, voted Democratic, but it was for local reasons for a, a brief period. But they were aligned with white artisans in the North, so economically and politically, racially, they were united in recognizing 
the threat to the idea of democracy, uh, which was uh, the South. Uh, and this was this very small window in which whites and blacks were politically uni united in the same party. Um, and uh, uh, following that, by 18... But then later on, our friend Huey Long made another attempt yes, to connect Huey them. Huey Long is another great example <laughs> of Louisiana, particularly being in Louisiana. Huey Long, he would he had a band perform, and his his um, signature was a song that was called "Every Man a King, Every Woman a Queen," and he, and Huey Long, a Louisiana Southern Louisiana, said that he included. African Americans and every man a king and every woman a queen, um, but the state prohibited him from doing so. But he made it clear that you know if the state allowed him to, he would it would truly be this interracial proletariat with the potential of rising up. He was also corrupt as in, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it was not a proletariat. It was what I call the subjective petty bourgeoisie. <laughs> But he is, <laughs> he had a vision that was, that still resonates for um, a number of African Americans and whites in, in the South. So you might say that with respect to the problem that affirmative action is designed to solve, but to my mind does not solve, but rather complicates, an alternative might go along the following lines, as you say. It is a mistake to conflate the problem of individualized racial discrimination with the promotion of, with, uh, of collective promotion of, group, of disadvantaged groups. Policies of collective promotion should be separated from the issue of individualized racial discrimination. So individual, individualized racial discrimination should be punished. Uh, it should be even criminalized, as it is in many countries. Uh, but promotion of collective promotion of groups from circumstances of disadvantage is entirely separate. And that should be based on actual disadvantage and not on a presumption of disadvantage from these external physical characteristics. So in the actual disadvantages, class, the class position of the victim will almost always have primacy. And what is characteristic of these situations of disadvantage is that the accumulation of many forms of disadvantage, including the complication of class by race, increases or entrenches the disadvantage. Uh, and then we have to have a policy for that. But we should not conflate that with the punishment of individualized racial discrimination. So that would be the beginning. Now, furthermore, we could say the following. There is a task in the state, in a democratic state, which exists within the setting of a class society of coming to the rescue of groups that find themselves caught in a circumstance of disadvantage or exclusion from which they are unable to escape by the forms of collective economic and political action that are available to them. And there should be an, a, a part of the state that should be equipped, designed, legitimated, funded to come to the rescue of those groups. Now, in the tripartite structure of government set up by the Constitution, there is no branch of government that, that is equipped and designed to do that. Because if the evil is structural, it, can't, it shouldn't be dealt with by the executive. The executive is supposedly to implement the laws, not to redesign some part of society. But if it's localized rather than general, it can't be the object of general norms or laws, and it's not appropriate for the legislature either. And the judiciary traditionally deals with individualized violations of right, 
and it also seems inadequate to this action. Now, what has happened as a matter of fact in the United States is that <clears throat> the branch of government that wanted to do something about these situations has been the judiciary, the federal judiciary, during the period in which the liberals in the United States acquired hegemonic influence over the federal judiciary, a period which now seems to be closing, but which existed in several decades of the past century. And they then developed a novel form of adjudication under the label of the structural injunctions or of complex enforcement. So, and they intervened in prison systems, in school systems, in mental asylums, and reshaped them when they were viewed as imposing a form of subjugation that contradicted the ideals attributed to the law. So here was a new form of adjudication. The agents in this new form of adjudication were no longer individual right holders. They were collective entities. Uh, the evil to be redressed was not the violation of an individualized right. It was a contradiction between the way a certain organization or practice was organized and the ideals attributed to law. And the redress did not consist in reestablishing the status quo ante antecedent to the violation of the right. The redress consisted in entering into the causal background of part of social life and fixing the sources of the evil, of the, of, of the structural evil that was seen. Uh, now, of course, it's complicated because in reality, everything in social life is connected. So where should you stop? If the idea is to fix injustice in a local school system, uh, where do the judges stop in this work of restructuring? They had no natural stopping point. And they were not the appropriate agent to begin with. So the theory of the structural injunction split the difference between two legal theories. One theory was if there's a mandate of substantive law, whether or not there's an appropriate role agent, implement the mandate. And if you need to, then use an inappropriate agent to carry out the mandate. That was one theory. The opposite theory was implement the substantive mandate only to the extent that there is a legitimate institutional agent. It was an arbitrary splitting of the difference between these two theories. So why did they focus on these relatively peripheral institutions like school systems, prisons, and insane asylums? Why didn't they go on? Why didn't they restructure the banks? because they wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been allowed to. They were unelected judges. They ran out of power. Uh, that was the reality. So the completely ad hoc invention uh, in a circumstance in which the appropriate agent did not exist to this structural problem. So, and that's how, whenever there's a transformative task in the world, the appropriate agent to implement it never exists because the world is organized for its own reproduction. The world is not organized to transform itself. So we seize on some agent that is inappropriate in Congress. We use that agent incongruously. And then after the fact, retrospectively, we create the right agent. So this is to say that this redesign of the problems of affirmative action that I just outlined would have to go together with the creation of this other activity in the state. A new branch of government, a new action to do on a large scale, to do in spades what the structural injunctions or complex enforcement did in a haphazard and arbitrarily truncated way. And all of that, all of this reconnection of class and race, 
would only be likely to work in a broader context, in a context in which we were attempting to democratize the market order and to deepen democracy, to democratize the market order by going from a knowledge economy for the few to a knowledge economy for the many, by enlisting finance in the service of the productive agenda of society, and by attempting to make free work the basis of the market order really free, rather than consigning an increasing majority of the labor force to radical economic insecurity in the form of precarious labor. And the replacement of the low energy democracy of today by a high energy democracy, uh, elevating the temperature of politics, the level of organized popular engagement in political life, hastening the pace of politics through the rapid resolution of impasse between the political branches of government, and combining a facility for decisive central action with radical devolution to exploit the experimentalist potential of the federal system. So it's only in that larger context that this alternative that I mentioned with respect to the relation between race and class would be likely to come to life. But that's how the real world is. The little things suggest the big things. The profit uh, offers the alternative, but also provides a down payment, the first installment, in order to make tangible the alternative future that he promises. Got questions? Comments? So just to be clear, the heart, the, the heart of what I said is, a, is to reinterpret the relation between class and race in a way which serves the objective of structural change, of structural reform. That's the heart of it. And the particular example was the alternative way of doing what affirmative action sets out to do, but in my estimation, fails. Yes? How would the welfare state, that for example, welfare state as a concept, um, go into, you know, helping the disadvantaged, right, or aiding them, assisting them, how would that play into that government? Well, let me stop back, because the idea of the welfare state is an idea that comes from the history, from the past, of institutionally conservative social democracy, which, after all, is the default position of the progressives throughout the world. So the, uh, the model of political and economic life to which the progressives in most of the world are attracted is not the United States. It's some idea that they have, for example, of Scandinavian social democracy. So that's why many of the American progressive leaders would like the United States to become the Sweden of the 1970s. Uh, uh, but social democracy was all about a haven of protections of the individual worker and citizen from the insecurities of the market. So the idea is that the individual would be secured in this haven of safeguards against public and private oppression and of capability ensuring endowments, economic endowments and educational endowments. That was the focus of social democracy. Social democracy had no productivist project. It had no no approach to the supply side of the economy. It abandoned the supply side to the conservatives. And that's also what happened in the United States. And I would say by opposition to this idea that uh, that's always going to be a losing position in politics. Whichever political force most credibly embodies 
the cause of creation, of energy, of innovation, uh, defines the agenda. And the other force is then condemned to humanize that agenda. That's what happened in social democracy. Uh, uh, and so the larger program of which this recon reconceptualization of the relation between race and class would have to be a part, you should say. The haven is not enough. Around the haven, we want the storm, the storm of innovation, of experiment, of conflict. The purpose of the haven is to equip the individual so he can thrive and flourish in the storm. Uh, and then, given the realities of class society, there's a, one of the preliminary problems is that there are groups in the society, uh, victims of the class structure and of the relation of the class structure with racial oppression, who find themselves caught in these circumstances of subjugation or disadvantage from which they are unable to escape. So it's not enough to organize the storm in general. It's necessary to deal with those particular structural sources of disadvantage. And thus, the idea of finding a generalized counterpart to the structural injunctions or complex enforcement. Yes? So would a concept like the basic income would be a haven that like protects the Exactly, the exactly. And, and if you ask me what do I think of that, I'd say it means something completely different. If it is the end itself, or if it's simply a condition for the other thing. Huh? So it's exactly, so what, it, what is the basic conception of a fundamental right? So there are, two, there are two dimensions to it. One dimension is that you take something out of the agenda of short-term politics by entrenching it constitutionally, protecting it, saying to change it you need a supermajority some legal device, or even conferring on it a certain ideological sanctity. You take it out of the agenda of short-term politics, paradoxically because you want to increase the agenda of short-term politics. That's the technical aspect of a fundamental right. The substantive purpose is because you want to, you want to deepen the agency of the individual. You want him to stand up. And for him to stand up then, it's necessary that the social space around him not be rigidified. Now let me complicate this a little bit. So imagine a spectrum of societies, uh, a thought experiment in which at one pole of the spectrum is a scriptural caste society in which the identity and security of the individual are inseparable from his participation in his caste. So any change in that caste is a threat to him. So then there's a complete entanglement of the individual identity and security with the rejudification of the social space. Now imagine the opposite pole of that spectrum in which you say, the ways in which we define the haven, these powers of the individual, are totally separate from the organization of the political and economic institutions. We want them to be plastic. And as much as possible, we want to disentangle the devices by which we affirm the security of the individual from this regenification of the social and economic space. Now, where are we in this imaginary spectrum? We're not at that second pole. We're someplace in the middle. And here comes a, a, a subtlety which I think is not widely understood about the ideological debate. In the 19th century, it was believed that the whole system of private law, the established definition of a market order, was part of the conception of freedom to be free meant to live according to that rule. We no longer believe that. We believe something else. What we believe is a negative, minimalist version of that belief. We believe 
that it's not that class that the unified property right and the so-called capitalist market order are part of the conception of freedom. It's rather that we can't replace that form without threatening freedom. That's the negative counterpart. That's the minimalist. That's what we believe. And so, if that's the form of the ideological debate, then there is, it becomes absolutely crucial to define the alternative forms of a market and the alternative forms of democracy. Because the negative solution, the negative minimalist version of the idea depends entirely on the notion that there are no alternatives. And that's then a crucial part of the ideological debate. The dictatorship of no alternatives. The world is restless under the yoke of the dictatorship of no alternatives. And we need to face that squarely. So all of this discussion is part of that debate. Uh, now, then going back in the light of that to the idea of fundamental right. The analogy is to the relation of a parent to a child. The parent says to the child, I love you. You have an unconditional place in my love. That's the haven. And then the parent says, now go out and raise a storm in the world. Uh, and, that's, and that's the other side. So social democracy has the part about the haven. What it doesn't have is the part about the storm. And the presence of the storm entirely transforms the meaning of the part about the haven. That's the answer to the question about universal basic income. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on your, this is going back a little bit, um, on your idea that it's implausible that the accommodationist or the collaborativist approach um, could function because um, there couldn't be such mass mobilization or uh, no one would be satisfied with a modest result. Yeah, I, I, find, it, I find it implausible. I mean, but it's, it's not a, it's not a, uh, a fatal objection to it. It's, it was a remark I made to suggest that it's implausible because the, collaborational, the collaborationist approach supposes that the elites will give this gift to the, to the movement, now, Booker T. Washington's movement. He wants these small holes. No one gives anything to anyone uh, in, 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 in history, right? In the history of these classes. It has to be taken. Uh, and so there, ha there has to be this pressure. Uh, otherwise, it's like a little concession, a marginal concession. So in fact, for this idea of this petty bourgeois world to work, the simulacrum, huh? it's like you have, you, have, you have all these artisans and craftsmen. They've waned in the north now with economic accumulation, but now it's going to have a second wave. That's a huge historical project. That's not something that uh, you're going to get by speaking with Mr. Carnegie and Mr. Rockefeller and making a few visits to Teddy Roosevelt in the White House. There's going to have to be mass mobilization. Yes. And, they uh, would, and the Rockefellers and yeah. would probably oppose it. Of course. They, were, they, they saw uh -huh. the, in, the industrialization as the uh, as the solution and as the great improvement over an artisanal idea. Yes. Um, yeah, I was just asking if you could say more about connecting, because we talked a lot about how, I guess, the traditional approaches to the race issue were kind of unsatisfactory, but I'm not sure if I've seen the connection to a lot of the other, like, reformist, or, yeah, the reforms that you mentioned, just in the sense where it's like, they sound, at least at a high level, to be generally race neutral. Like I know we criticize the integrationist approach because it puts identity politics like put seems puts race ahead of class, and like there are problems with that. Well, most of them are race neutral, neutral, but that's why I suggested that there would have to be a bridge between this, these race neutral institutional changes and the and an initiative in the state. It was designed to come to the rescue of a group that could not escape from the circumstance of disadvantage by the instruments of collective action available to it. And I was thinking especially of the underclass black. 
as the example of that. So that's a, a structural pro a localized or episodic structural problem. Now, the theory of the democratic state, of this liberal constitutionalism, is that structural problems can be addressed by legislation only to the extent that they're universal problems, not if they're localized or episodic. And that's, that's not the circumstance of society. In a real society with a class structure in which race overlaps with class, there are going to be circumstances of disadvantage that do not lend themselves to these universalistic solutions. And thus the need for a special bridge. That, that was what motivated, the, that was the place uh, of, of this idea of uh, a broader form of complex enforcement in, in my proposal. So that's where we make like a new of government? That's where, so, so, that's where you're saying there's, there's a group here which no matter what we do by way of creating a high energy democracy or by way of making the resources and practices of the knowledge economy available to a much broader cast of economic agents. There's a group there which is in such a situation of disadvantage, of subjugation, of exclusion, that it's not going to be able to lift itself up unless we come to the rescue, we being the state politics. Huh? And so that, that, was, that was the reasoning. Huh? And in a sense, the premise is my premise of agreeing with you that the universalistic policies are unlikely to suffice given the historical specificity of these situations in which different forms of disadvantage accumulate and entrench, imprison a certain group in a dungeon from which it can't escape. And then you have to open the you have to open the, the gates of the dungeon. That that was a theory. So I'm throwing another question, and that would be. what would be required for the current Democratic Party to um, recruit uh, the many poor whites of the Republican Party and align with now dominant Afri people of color in the Democratic Party? What would need to happen? And is that feasible? And if so, how might that occur? So I think the progressives would have to have a, as I said, the progressive approach to the supply side of the economy. They would have to have, to start with, a strategy of economic growth, other than the strategy that they had up to now. The strategy that they have up to now is essentially just cheap money. And it's not implemented by the federal government, it's implemented by the central bank, by the Federal Reserve. Huh? So ever since the Second World War, the, the, the basic strategy of economic growth in the United States has been the democratization of credit rather than the democratization of property. So a fake credit democracy has been put in the place of a property-owning democracy. Fits perfectly with the growing consumer society. Yes, exactly. So the fake credit democracy is then, you know, then there's a there's a problem, which is that in the closing decades of the 20th century, the United States uh, underwent uh, uh, a degeneration into radical inequality uh, in many dimensions. Uh, and there's an obvious contradiction between a strategy of growth based on mass consumption and inequality, because mass consumption requires uh, 
the democratization of purchasing power. So what's the solution? The solution was to democratize not property but credit. And, and that was made possible in part by the overvaluation of the housing stock as collateral. Now that in turn uh, uh, required money to be cheap. So the, the cheap money policy, which was the main strategy of economic growth in the United States, had two main effects. One effect was to under, underwrite this uh, fake credit democracy. Huh? Uh, the other effect was to produce asset bubbles, which, which immensely enriched the asset holding class, the, the plutocracy at the top, and to a lesser extent, the professional and business class. Huh? Uh, and then there's one more thing to say, which is the, the, this domestic policy was in turn further enabled by the structural imbalances in the world economy between the surplus economies and the deficit economies, especially between China and the United States. So the motor of growth in the world economy in the decades leading up to the crisis of 2008 was the relation between the Chinese and the American economy. The, the Americans had trade and capital deficits, and those deficits then were the reverse of the Chinese trade and capital surpluses. And each of these two countries used these structural imbalances as a way of escaping the imperative of internal structural change. So China, according to a general view, a view which is general even within China, would have to deepen its internal market and use the deepening of internal market as a complement to the, the export-led growth. So export-led growth not suppressing the internal market. And the United States would have to have a productivist project not allow its knowledge economy to be confined to a series of fringes, but deepen and disseminate the knowledge economy uh, in the way about which we that we discussed previously. Huh? Uh, and so th they were two strategies of evasion. So that's a circumstance. So the progressives didn't face that circumstance. Instead of providing a uh, an economic program that would respond to the needs and aspirations of the working class majority, including the white working class majority of the country, they then took refuge in these, in these several forms of evasion. They had the Federal Reserve continue this policy of cheap money as the basis of growth. They developed the idea of a rainbow coalition of this identity politics, uh, which was really a flight from dealing with the structural problems of society. Uh, now, I'm not saying that the New Deal would have been the model, because as we've said before, the focus of the New Deal was economic restabilization and antidotes to economic insecurity. It was not the democratization of economic opportunity, the economic empowerment of the ordinary man and woman. That's a different program. So they couldn't use the New Deal as their model. They would have to have a different model. Uh, but that's what they haven't had. So they, 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 there's been this abdication. That's the argument. And then the, the, the poisonous onus, the, the historical legacy of race, then poisons the waters, right? Because it creates this additional complication. But the complication could be turned on its head and used as an opportunity if we rethought these things in all of their elements. And that's what I was just trying to do by these proposals. And politically, it's interesting that uh, African Americans were com wedded to the Republican Party of Lincoln long after the party became radically something else, a, a party of 
uh, industrialization for whites. And the first time the majority of African Americans voted Democratic was for FDR in FDR's second term, because in his uh, policy he offered for the first time uh, uh, African Americans to participate in his um, in um, in his uh, CCC and other uh, organizations. Despite Chance Nelson's thesis, right. that the blacks ended up paying the price for the New right. Deal. In many respects, he, he's, Nelson is right. Uh, and then it wasn't uh, African Americans that were with the tenants, so they voted for uh, Eisenhower. Uh, and then in the post war period, they have become um, with the desegregation and uh, civil rights, uh, they've been committed. 90 to 93% of African Americans vote for Democratic. Yeah. So they voted for all of these Democratic presidents who have faithfully executed the Republican agenda, right? Sure, yes, yes. In yes. And Carter, Clinton, Obama, and so forth. Uh, and they've done that while the situation of the underclass backs has continued to degenerate. And, and not just the uh, economic situation, but the legal situation, the prison system. Uh, and so that that's this tragic aspect in which the, the, the there's this cooperation with these regime the sort of the situation of the blacks continue to degenerate of the underclass in the presidency of Obama, the first black president, and this just goes on. So I think the, um, of course, one of the rhetorical problems, the problem of persuasion, is the false idea that any alternative to this would be revolutionary. And that's what I've tried to get away from, right? This, this binary idea, of, this is the Marxist idea, there are these indivisible systems. Like capitalism is a system. Yeah. It's all one big package. And so there's a binary idea of politics. Politics is either the reformist management of one of these systems, or it's the revolutionary substitution of one system for another. Then the idea of revolution becomes an alibi for its opposite, right? Because the way they think is a real change would be a revolutionary substitution of one system for another. That's not in the cards. If it were in the cards, it would be too dangerous. So what's left to do? What's left to do is to humanize the world, to develop the entitlements, to attenuate inequality by compensatory redistribution in the form of tax and transfer and so forth. So that's the, that's the, the concept of revolutionary change being turned upside down and transformed into a pretext for its opposite. I mean, there's also been a long history of um, American intellectuals um, embracing or emphasizing um, dramatic change or substantive, substantive change in the United States only when there is a revolutionary moment. So there is a relatively recent book of um, One Step Forward, um, and it's on, uh, focuses on race, and essentially the argument is that the only periods in which there's been substantive uh, progress in terms of uh, race in the United States uh, is during periods in which the United States is at war with a very powerful threatening enemy. And the United States recognizes that they need African-Americans are minorities on their side in order to defeat this powerful threatening enemy. And the, the periods were the revolution in which both the Patriot and the, um, and the uh, uh, British cause, a number of uh, black shot fought for both sides. The Civil War, uh, United States rule in World War I was so small that it really did not affect it, but World War II was profound. And World War III points out that um, every single 
um, Cold Warrior um, in the wake of World War II was also a civil rights activist and arguing that in order to defeat communism, we need blacks on our side. So that the civil rights, the classic civil rights era of the 60s was during a period was made possible from the state half, from the statesmen by this powerful no. red so it's so it's interesting to, to to reflect on this idea of these foundational moments in American history, right? Because a common view is there have been three such foundational moments. One was the establishment of the Republic, the independence and the constitution. Second the second was the Civil War and its aftermath, and the third is the New Deal. That's right. Huh? And, that's and, the, and all three have been associated with wars uh, and as part of this yes, yes. struggle over the ascent. And, and, and most scholars see it as these, these revolutionary moments, these brief periods where dramatic change can happen. And for yes. most theorists of revolution, um, the problem of revolutionary time is that it's very short lived. Yeah. And that you don't know what yes. exactly happened. And it's interesting to see this idea refracted in legal history, in the history of legal ideas, right? So yeah. there's a moment of refoundation. In the moment of refoundation, the jurists are at the table as participating in the construction of the architecture, and like in Roosevelt's brain trust and so forth. Yeah. Then there's a moment. The then there's, after this brief, brief moment of refoundation, there's the rather long normalization, right? In which the jurists then uh, are work out systematically the implications of the new institutional and ideological settlement. Huh? And so, for example, in the New Deal, legally, a new body of public law was superimposed on a largely untransformed body of private law. The basic law governing the nature of the market was not was not transformed. Contract property and the law of business enterprise. There's a new body of public law. So they worked that out as a system. Then comes the third moment, which is the most interesting. The third moment is the moment of darkening, uh, in which the institutional and ideological settlement is retreats into the mass its implications for the fighting issues of today becomes less and less clear. And the jurists then start to adopt an ironical or tactical attitude to their own statements. So, uh, as if they're using them as pawns or tools in some political struggle, uh, without really believing, or if they half believe, in the assumptions of their own discourse. So the typical formula of a law article in a, one of the American law reviews was, is the jurist takes a body of law and he expounds it in the light of underlying policies and principles. And then he says, but that scheme of policy and principle doesn't explain all of it, it just explains most of it. There's a part of it that's mistaken and then at the end, there comes a critique of the law, the transformation of the part that's mistaken. So it depends on a series of happy accidents. That the, it, it's a system that works itself pure. It becomes more and more organized. It's, it, it can be understood in the light of these underlying policies and principles. Uh, and what you see now is that the jurists themselves clearly don't believe in the assumptions of this discourse, but they treat them as platonic lies. They're useful. In some struggle, uh, they're affiliated with conservative or progressive tendencies, and they write the Law Review articles as instruments, as rhetorical instruments in this situation. And this could go on for a long time, right? So how long has this period of darkening been going on? It's been going on for, what, 70 years? Or, uh, it could go on indefinitely until the next institutional or ideological settlement. So what's the implication of that whole story? The implication of that whole story is that 
we have an interest in getting ourselves out of this narrative of these cycles uh, in which there's a meteor that has to visit the Earth, right? It's like Halley's Comet in War and Peace. Pierre looks up at the sky, he sees the comet. The comet presages Napoleon's invasion of Russia. And then he, he intuits that the invasion will rip up everyone's life. They'll be taken out of their ruts uh, and they'll live for sure. Then when that's over, they'll go back to sleep and so forth. They'll become somnambulant again. Uh, they'll be like the Europeans who go back to sleep after their wars and drown their sorrows in consumption. So what is our interest? Our interest is that the, the, those normal periods would have to take on some of the attributes of the periods of refoundation so that there wouldn't be this rhythm of waking up and sleeping and we have a personal interest in this if our lives happen to have fallen in one of those long interludes between the visits of the comet. Because what are we going to do? Are we just going to wait for the next comet, the next war, the next economic collapse? Or are we going to create arrangements and practices and ideas that don't require trauma as a condition of transformation? That's a superior form. Huh? And I think it, it might. It, it, it must appeal to the part of the message of the American prophets that gives a central role to agency. Yes, yes. The enhancement of agency. Yes. Why should we be the helpless victims of fate, uh, depending on these accidents of history, of our place in history, rather than taking matters into our own hand and creating arrangements that make change less dependent on crisis? Huh? which is the reverse side of the enhancement of agency. Yes. Yes. I mean, to go back to the, the concept of the frontier, the frontier has incorporated both, the sense of crisis, but also the space for an American prophet to be regenerated without the, without the, um, the crisis that, that would need to occur. Yes. So there's a, there's a greater open-endedness in how the frontier has been conceptualized uh, over the, the past 150 years. Dramatically different ways of conceptualization. In the, in, in that perspective, in the possibility of through agency. So what would the progressives who are not here in the room, presumably, the conventional progressives, because what would, the progressives what would they say? How would they protest against these arguments? Uh, I, I think of progressives would protest against our argument by emphasizing um, the greater, the, they would protest by saying that we don't properly recognize the importance of um, race and identity politics uh, within the United States. But we are recognizing it. I mean, we're giving a different yeah. solution to it, that's a different exactly response right. to that's it. That's exactly right. Yeah. I would think that they would say, it seems to me that they would say two things in the first instance. First, they would say that we're, that we're vastly exaggerating the opportunities for transformation, that, that the restraints in the society are on, on any change. That is, they would try and force this discussion back into the mold of the moderate versus the extreme, yeah. which I've been trying to escape, right? right. Because I'm saying structural change can't be, un structural right. change is not more extreme than non-structural change. It's a different kind of change. 
And it doesn't matter that the steps be very large steps. It matters in what direction they go in and that there be a particular sequence. Yes. That's the argument. But they would also say, and this would be the Madisonian element, that I am, I am uh, understating the dangers for the arousal of these political furies, right? right. That once I, right. once I empower the majority uh, and create this fever of high energy politics, I ride a monster which we may be unable to tame. Right. So there, in a sense, there's this great fear of what they would probably define as revolution. Well, it's really fear of the people. It's a demophobic element. Yeah, the demog demog demagoguery, but in the form of a revolution in, in one of the characteristics of a revolution is that you don't know which way the revolution will go. Yeah. You have no control over it. It can go. It can go. It can go in any direction. Because it's evoking this idea of revolution, like exactly. the French Revolution, That's exactly the right. Russian Revolution, That's Russian. and I mean, the, the American Civil War could have easily gone another way, easily. And if you uh, have instances that differ, and so uh, theorists of revolution, in one sense, they they refer to it as, they use the metaphor of a bowl, and that in a, um, in a democracy, you pour milk in a bowl and it settles, and it's, um, uh, there's, no, there's no threat that the bowl or the milk is gonna splatter everywhere. <laughs> and in a revolution, if you turn the bowl upside down, you pour milk, it splatters on all sides, and you know, it's, it creates chaos. And uh, for a lot of um, a lot of uh, people, that chaos is more threatening than any political change. So I, I have so I understand that that's what they would say, and 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 the answer is that the circumstance in which we are unable to to solve or even to address the problems of the majority of working people is the real source of danger. And it's from that frustration, from that experience of disempowerment and blockage that these political passions arise, the frustration, and then the appeal to the easy, to the, to the right-wing populism and so forth, that that's the source of the danger. That the source of the danger is impotence, the impotence of democracy to control the affairs of the citizens. Yes, that's very good. The, the source of the danger is impotence rather than revolution. <laughs> yes. And I, I understand the argument that we're, we're trying to transform the structure of capitalism, but how would we consider Cedric Robinson's argument in Black Marxism that American capitalism is racial capitalism, so we need to first address the categories of race before we get to cap capitalism structural reform. Well, I guess, so first of all, I'm bothered by the term capitalism, right? Because uh, I, I don't know what it means. So uh, my understanding is that there's no natural recurrent system like the market economy exists in a canonical form. What we describe as cap, cap what we describe as capitalism is a uh, a particular form of the market order that evolved in modern Western, especially modern European history. Uh, and it's not like it's an instance of a recursive, a recurrent type. There is no such type. There is no such system. Uh, so. The market order has no single natural and necessary form. The question is, what form should we want it to take? That's the real debate. Now, in the form it does take in the United States, it, sustain, it helps sustain a particular relation between class and race. That's what we've been discussing during the class today. 
And one of the one of the approaches to the relation between race and class that we could take uh, then we actually encourage the revision of the economic and political arrangements. Uh, because as I said, this other, this other approach to the race issue is only likely to flourish when we're taking in a broader context. And the broader context is the context of attempting to energize democratic politics and of democratizing the market order. Uh, so it's the it's the un, it's the unaccomplished sequel to Roosevelt's project that we would need, uh, and of course it would have to address the relation between race and class. We've been discussing how to address it, right? And the other critique I would um, mention is that. Uh, Capitalism included the artisanal ideal in the 19th century and then evolved into a different form of system, but it was still capitalistic based on how most economists define the, the term capitalism. So it's, um, there's a... Uh, economists don't, it's, it's not a concept in economics, right? Capitalism. Correctly, yeah, no. exactly. It's, it's really become more a concept in... It's an ideological conception. Yeah, an ideological but this example of the use of the term capitalism points to a serious problem. And the serious problem is the use of the Marxist categories by people who no longer believe in any of the assumptions of Marxist theory. That is, almost no one believes in, Mar in Marxist theory of society and history and its strict assumptions that there are these indivisible systems, these regimes, slave society, feudalism, capitalism, so that each of them is an indivisible system, that there are laws governing the foreordained succession of these systems in history. Almost no one believes in those things. They're, they're incompatible with what we've learned through historical insight and through political experience. But the problem is that we use then these concepts which draw their meaning from this theoretical context without believing in the context. So it's a, it's a kind of self-deception, which is very dangerous because we're using concepts that no longer have a clear meaning. That's right, huh? that's right, that's right. That are, that are... So Karl Marx meant by capitalism a system in which labor could be bought and sold and the surplus produced by labor could be confiscated by the so-called capitalists. But in the context of uh, the idea that it's an architecture, all the parts of it fit together. And it's the architecture that he explored in his, in his work, in Das Kapital. Uh, it's a system. And all of the parts of the system interact and reinforce each other. And there are laws governing it, governing its reproduction, its crisis, its substitution. Now, if you don't believe in, the, in those assumptions, you can't really use that vocabulary with any confidence in the meaning of those words. Uh, and I think that's the problem. So, the progressives no longer believe in Marxism for the most part. They continue to use the neo-Marxist vocabulary. And what and so they they have no clear insight into how structural change happens. That's our problem. And right, I mean, said when where we do, so next week we're going to have a programmatic discussion about the American alternative. And there's a, the generic problem of the discussion of alternatives. I'll say it once again. I describe something that's close to what exists. You say, well, that's feasible, but it's trivial. I describe something that's far away from what exists. You say, that's very interesting, but it's utopian. So almost anything that can be proposed in the present climate of opinion is likely to be dismissed as either trivial or utopian. Now, so that's a false dilemma. Why is it false? Because 
it imagines a, tran a transformation, structural change, or a programmatic argument is about blueprints. It's not about blueprints, it's about successions of steps. And anything that is worth discussing as an alternative can be described at points that are relatively close to what exists or relatively far away from what exists. Now, what immensely aggravates this false dilemma is our, the history of ideas. So the main intellectual influence on the idea of the progressives has been Marxism. And we, we no longer believe in it. Uh, and, but we have no other idea about structural change, how to think about it, how to talk about it. And so by default, our conception of a proposal being realistic is that it be close to what already exists. We say it's realistic if it's close to what exists. It's not realistic, it's utopian if it's far away from what exists. That's not a conception of structural change or political realism. That's just a declaration of intellectual bankruptcy. We don't have a way of we, we don't have a way of talking about alternatives. So we fall back on this fake criterion of political realism that realistic is what's close to what exists. That's that's not a conception of political realism. So that then aggravates this dilemma. Now and so then it happens in the world that the progressives very often uh, appear, want to want, pretend that they're concealing for tactical reasons a plan, which in fact they don't have. Because you, 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 to have a plan about an alternative, it has to live in many minds, it has to be the object of a collective discussion. It can't be a tactical secret. Uh, which is what the kind of programmatic discussion we now, or non-discussion that we now have in the world. So I'm not suggesting that a programmatic discussion is an easy discussion to have now. It's very hard. No one knows how to argue and think programmatically now. That's the problem. But the world wants alternatives. So the world is bent under this yoke of the dictatorship of no alternatives and anxiously seeks alternatives. The main space in which there is this contest over alternatives or the absence of them is the state, the nation state, the sovereign state. And we're discussing one of them now, the United States. Uh, and, but it's the same world debate. It's the debate about alternatives or the absence of them. Back. So you had mentioned the importance of like successive steps in potentially reaching these alternatives, and I wonder if that contradicts the importance of what the successive steps successive to steps, reaching yeah. alternatives. And I'm wondering if that somewhat um, or how you would respond to the contention that that contradicts your disapproval of affirmative action in seeing affirmative action as maybe not on the whole, a perfect substitution for certain policies that might better the situations of certain classes of citizens, but a potential successive step towards... Toward what? Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, the argument is there are steps in the wrong direction. Uh, so it's, the problem with affirmative action is not that it's gradualist or piecemeal. The question is, the conception, the direction to which it's oriented. And now I think we, we can pronounce a judgment on it. It's benefited most of people who least need the benefit. So it's, it's, a, it's a practical judgment. But I'm not condemning it for its piecemeal character. I'm condemning it for its direction and its, its false assumptions and its results. By, your, by, their, by your, their fruits you shall know them. I'm saying, look at it. Look at look at look at what it's done. This hasn't worked, uh, and it, the rest of the world thinks of it as a quota system. And then the Americans say, no, no, this isn't a quota system. It's something else. And so, so there's there's an element also of self-deception in it. Yes, I think one of the counter arguments would be that 
affirmative action creates um, a diverse leadership class in society which can have inspirational and aspirational value so that people across America can look at the leadership class, leadership class and say, oh, I, I can be there, that's something I can aspire to. And that has some of the same sort of aspirational value that you're looking for. So it's not just sort of redistributory, re 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 excuse me, it's not just redistributing, it's also kind of showing everyone that it's possible for you to be there in that space. Do you get that point? I agree with that. I see some force in that argument. And as I said, I think the greatest achievement of affirmative action has been the creation of a black bourgeoisie, including these leaders whom you mentioned. Uh, so it's done that. It's already done that. Uh, and uh, I don't think that that achievement is uh, threatened. Uh, it's done that at a, at a series of costs. One of the costs is separating those leaders from the mass of blacks uh, and accommodating them to the structure. Uh, uh, an opponent of this policy could say, as I do, it's a kind of Vichy policy of collaboration, which you collaborate with the, the opponent and you're there's this, this ambassadors in both directions. That is, you're an ambassador of the elites to, to the mass of poor blacks. And, and in the name of being ambassador of the poor blacks to the elites, I think this is an equivocal position. So I see its accomplishment, but I think it's a, uh, it's a very limited device. Uh, and in the meantime, the, the, the real victims continue to suffer, uh, an undiminished suffering, that's the real problem. Uh, and so the main focus of my alternative was to address their circumstance of subjugation, rather than simply to have these exemplars on top, showing that you can be black and go to Harvard and so forth. And, that's not good enough. Uh, and, and now around the world, of course, this takes on different meanings. So, uh, as I just said, we have this imitation of the American policy in Brazil. In a country in which, unlike the United States, there's widespread miscegenation. Most of the country is of mixed blood. Uh, and uh, again, it's in, in every instance when it's used, it's used as a way to supplant the politics of alternative structures, alternative institutional arrangements of the market or of democracy by this <coughs> policy that is addressed to these pre-social, pre-political groups, yeah, identity politics. And that all has a tremendous cost. Uh, and it feeds into this American idea, right, that the problems of society are ultimately not the problems of our own creation. They're problems that come from something primordial, like the you know, psychological problems, uh, the mind, brain, and behavior initiative at Harvard. Huh? So in every epoch in the 19th century and the 20th century, the American plutocrats were attracted to psychological and psychiatric inquiries. So in which the evils of society could be addressed by some form of psychological or biochemical manipulation not requiring change of the arrangements of society. Is that not an evil? I should say that also, just in terms of Harvard's comp or Harvard itself, I'm familiar with the, the admissions of for undergraduates, not at the um, graduate level, but the admissions um, in the undergraduate level do not um, themselves um, define what they do in terms of affirmative action. And yet, um, my understanding is that the, the freshman class this year is a white minority class. But there's long been, I mean, 
so faculty are invited to, um, to advise the admissions. And at Harvard, every year, there are students from every state. Um, and so they want diversity in all forms. Every state, and there are... There including are geographical. Geographical state in the United States, and, they're every, and they have students from new, a number of, a, a minimum number of a lot of different countries. They want diversity in all forms. Uh, but at least the form of class, right? The least a form of class. Yes, yes. because the the most obvious form of underrepresentation at these at these institutions is the underrepresentation of the working class, who are the majority of the country. Yes, um, and there are the majority of uh, undergraduates are, are from public schools, what we call public schools in the U.S. and the, uh, Europe and other parts of the world. That it's different, but it's it's this broad vision for. Um, diversity of all kinds because they, and I agree with it, that they, they believe that bringing together people from all different parts of the world from different backgrounds is itself a, 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 a very important, helpful form of education. And? <laughs> <laughs> undergraduates and they and undergraduates I mean as freshmen they have no choice it's actually their housing situation is now randomized they're randomized in terms of where they start as freshmen and then when they go through 